What does it really mean to put it all down? What does it really mean to pick it up? The same. No. That's when thinking Zen can be very dangerous. Putting it down means you put it all down. Then sky only blue, trees only green. That's what it means, put it all down. No individual thinking, no individual emotion. Your I, my, me is gone. You come back to this point. But if you don't put it all down, you cannot come back to this point. There's always some kind of I, my, me. Okay? So, too much thinking, put it all down. <laughs> More question? As I understand, okay, um, the pra my practice is for going to my basic instinct in order to be uh, true nature. So, in the interviews, um, I feel sometimes that when you ask me a kohan, it's just, I know the, the answer because it's, it, I, I, how can I distinguish uh, between my instincts that I can see that they are really from my inner child than from my uh, adult? When you completely put down your basic instincts, your true nature appears. Your basic instincts are survival, possession, procreation. There are many movies about that, okay? Including basic instinct. So, that's not your true nature. There's a lot of movies far less about your true nature too. Like Little Buddha. So, all your karma when it becomes an identity, goes subconscious, becomes an instinct. Okay? You can train yourself to have instinctual life. But what kind of instincts do you put into your subconscious? That is the question. So, for instance, you go and study martial arts. And first, the teacher explains to you, shows you everything. Then you do the form. You do the form for many years. And in some schools, sooner, in some other schools, later, you begin to spar. Practice how to fight. At that time, you cannot think. There's no more form. Everything has to come totally instinctively or spontaneously. If you don't think clearly during a form practice, your form goes bad. But if you think during sparring or fighting, you lose because you slow down and someone can hit you. So when you think, there's a gap in your presence. And in that gap, somebody can hit you. So this is a very good example how you can be very instinctual and spontaneous with something that you learned. That's not your true nature. It's the function of your karma. Now, if your true self is clear, then your karma functions very well. That's why you heard harmony is possible. But how to achieve that? And you really put down your I, my, me, there is the experience of becoming one. And this oneness experience, if you keep it, then it translates into correct recognition of your situation, the correct establishment of relationship, the correct function, how you perform your tasks every day. These are not your basic instincts. In fact, you have to retrain yourself. We have to really recondition ourselves so that it's not your previous karma that controls you, but it's your premeditated choices that are actually becoming instinctual, that are becoming subconscious, that are becoming intuitive. Okay? So there's a big difference between instincts and your true nature. So letting go is now, now, now. It comes and goes, and we shouldn't identify with it. Just to see it, whatever, that, whatever it is in front of your mirror consciousness, and just let it go. That's what you would say at a Buddhist university examination before your no, professor. You, Not to me. No, I'm, I'm speaking out of my own experience. Because oh, good. So then what's your question? If you have the experience, if very it's, good. It's okay. I mean, it, that's the way. <laughs> so, if you have your experience, why do you doubt it? 
because of my karma, because I usually doubt. So then your best teacher will be a tree. Trees have no doubts. And blue sky is only blue. The moment I open my mouth, you can start to doubt what you hear. But you cannot doubt a tree. You cannot doubt the grass. You cannot doubt that the sun rises in the morning and sets in the evening. At this point, whatever I say will make your doubts bigger. So that's why. Go, ask a tree. Tree is a wonderful teacher. <laughs> okay. And the second question is, um, <laughs> I, I had it prepared, I'm sorry. Uh, how do I know when to follow my like or dislike mind? Because decisions come out of this. So I know that the, the, I feel that the liking and disliking comes and goes and I don't really have to follow it. But there is, a, there is a point when we have to take a decision, so? If it becomes complicated, then you followed like and dislike mind. If it remains simple, then you didn't follow like and dislike mind. I will keep disappointing you. You're a good student. <laughs> More questions? Recently I started to uh, process uh, very difficult and life experience that I had. And I can see when I sit and I think, I try and process it, I can see how it uh, shaped me in a lot of life aspects. Shaped um, who I am, my, uh, okay, who I am today. Yeah, I can say that. Um, my question is, when I see it arises, I see how it shaped me, but still I can't let go of that um, life experience or the way it shaped me. And I would like your insight um, when it comes to really big life events, um, a turning point, you may say. I'm sorry, I cannot give you my insight. You already have yours. Why would I add to it? Why do you need me, my insight, why? Because I want to let go of it. I want, I want to... If you want to let go of it, why do you still walk around it in the most diplomatic manner? You still circumambulate that experience. Why? why? Why is it so important? If it wasn't, you just put it into the garbage of the past and you would forget it. So what is it that prevents you for, from forgetting that? I guess I feel very sorry for myself. That's it. So you feel sorry for yourself because you had to go through that experience and it shaped you into the shape that you are right now. Okay, so turn it around. If you wanted to generate that experience, how would you do that? Don't talk to me about it, talk to yourself. So instead of feeling sorry for yourself, get back to the seat of your own horse and try to go through, in your mind, the reverse. How would you make it happen if you wanted to? And then you see where you made your mistake. And then you can undo it. Instead of feeling sorry for yourself, you draw the conclusions that you have to draw. And you educate yourself by insight of cause and effect. I don't know what it is. Only you do. I cannot give you the insight because only you can. If you look at it very clearly, how would I make this happen if I had wanted to? Totally reverse thinking. But it helps you very much because it uncovers something which you readily do not see, which you willfully suppress, which is the mistake that you made. And you don't see it yet because you're not ready. You don't feel ready. You don't want to. But what was your hand in it? What kind of decision on your part led to it? Now, you can only uncover that if you reverse your thinking and you say, how would I want to make this happen? It's the key. And you've put that key into the lock, the whole secret opens. Something that you haven't seen before, you will see because you ask the right question. Therefore, you will get the right answer. 
and then you reverse the process again, which is now conscious, and then you can step by step undo what you've done. And you can stop being identified with it. You can stop feeling sorry for yourself. You can extract whatever wisdom and compassion you needed to get out of this experience and then move on. That's human. We can do that. And there's one thing which immediately can give you a different point of view than before. The Buddha says, without suffering, there is no enlightenment. If we do not realize that this world, including us, is impermanent, imperfect, and interdependent, we would never want to wake up. So what kind of awakening experience did this event give you? Maybe you don't see it fully. When you go through the process I have just described, you may. And then you can withdraw that energy which created the wrong thing for you, and then you can start helping others by creating the right thing from now on. So you have time. You stay here long enough. Go through it. Go through it. Take the risk of going through it. Take the risk of reversing your self-preservation process. Take the risk of not being defensive. Take the risk of losing your self-image. It all comes at a price. Okay? So when you pay that price, then you become clear. Because you could put it all down. And then you see how you made it. Then you don't have to feel sorry for yourself because that's something instead of seeing, instead of really perceiving, we just feel sorry for ourselves, for others, for the cat, for our parents, for our siblings. Feeling sorry if you made a mistake, it's important. But feeling sorry instead of perceiving cause and effect, that's useless. Okay? <clears throat> I know it's not okay. So talk to me. No, no. I just, in this, in this event, I don't see any cause and effect to look at. Really? N now I'm interested. <laughs> An event without cause and effect. Now that's something very, it's like God, you know? <laughs> so if an event has no cause and effect, it appeared and disappeared without cause and effect. Now that's something very, very interesting. Because it doesn't exist. Appearance and disappearance, they all depend on causes and conditions. It is possible that you don't see cause and effect. But if something appears and disappears, in other words, it follows the law of impermanence, it's impossible that it doesn't follow the other two laws, imperfection and interdependence. The two, the three, go hand in hand. Okay? If one exists, the other two also exist. Imperfection here is not... Like, you get what you don't want, or it's never good enough. That's human imperfection. But imperfection, in this case, means it's never finished. With humans, it's never enough, okay? So imperfection, in this case, you can always put more into the same basket, and you can always take away. The form is not permanent, and it's not finished in a way that you would say it's unchangeable. It doesn't change anymore. Like works of art, why we preserve these beautiful works of art that are uh, so valuable that you go to an auction and it's like millions and tens of millions of dollars, you know, boom. Because they themselves represent something which is not this world, which is really different from the rest of the world. Because they seem to be perfect. That you don't want to add anything to a Van Gogh painting or less, you know, take away something. It's perfect as it is. So we want to make it permanent. And we want to make it totally independent of causes and conditions. And that's why they are in a museum. That's why they are in special air-conditioned rooms. Because perfection requires permanence and independence. So it works the other way around too. And the moment you want to make something permanent, it has to be perfect. You see? And it has to be also independent. And if somebody really wants to be independent and totally, I am free, this is ultimate independence. With that comes the notion of perfection and almost living forever. The basic raw material for narcissism. Okay? So uh, it's really interesting how these three and the other three, they go hand in hand. That's why I say 
with absolute certainty that if something appears and disappears, it's never perfect, it's never permanent, and it's never independent of the environment. So how can you possibly have an event which has no cause and effect? It's impossible. But it is possible that the event is so painful that you are not ready to look at cause and effect, how it happened. Because you don't, it's still too painful. Now that's something I accept. And you get all the help you need to finally face it, release yourself, put that to the past, and stop being judgmental about it concerning you and the other person or persons involved in it. That's your potential. That's everybody's potential. Okay? More questions? You just said a clear mind can be stronger than your karma. Yeah. Uh, and you said about your friend and about the accident. Uh, Actually, I talked about his death. It wasn't an accident. Sorry. Okay. He committed suicide. Ah, okay. So it's different. Well, I, now I follow. Okay. I circumvented it out of respect for his memory, but, but imagine someone who did all the possible uh, tricks with karate, and he was, uh, he was in the Hungarian champions team with over 720 jumps with the parachute in formation in individual. He was a genius. He was a teacher. He had a kid. He had a good family. But he couldn't handle this. And he goes up to the tower of one of the outer railway stations, and he knows perfectly how to jump except he didn't carry a parachute with him. So he did. He wanted to end it because in the, in the vicinity, nobody was able to help him. He was connected to priests, to friends, many, many people. Yet something was missing. And that kind of autonomy, which I answered to Moni's question, that kind of spiritual autonomy, that kind of experience of the non-dual mind, of this clear mirror mind, of this non-attached mind, which has nothing but everything. So that kind of experience was missing. When we were kids, we had images, metaphors, and cognitive structures at age 14 and 15, which I never saw except when I conversed with him. And he was in the same way. We, we kind of put our brains together we could really have fantastic structures and thoughts and intellectual uh, constructs, you know. But his life went one way and my life went this way. And last year, when I returned from Korea, something really urged me to find him. I haven't spoken with him for almost 30 years. Because when we were early teenagers, we, we had our strong time, and when I became, you know, Buddhist and uh, university time, we, we already didn't meet so much. But we spent pretty much like eight, nine years of weekly meetings, very close. So, after like 20, 25 years of uh, absence, not even corresponding, something knocked at my heart's door to actually go find him. It took me 10 seconds over the internet. I knew that he was a teacher. I knew where he was teaching. And of course, I know his name. So the homepage of the school comes. I give a, a call to the central number. I didn't know anything about him. You know, I didn't want to go to the former address, maybe move, he's married, etc. I didn't want to just knock at the door. I wanted to find him in real life. I said, I want to see him, but don't tell him. So the concierge at the school tells me, okay, he has a class at this and this hour on Thursday. So I show up on Thursday at the end of the class and I, said, and I say to the concierge, okay, call him down. Just tell him he has a visitor. So after 25 years of not seeing me, he looks at me with the same eyes, gives me the same hug, and he says, hey, bro, I haven't seen you for ages. And we talked for like two hours nonstop because he had like a, a break. But he could not come out of the past. That's what I noticed. He only talked about the past, our past. And whatever pro I saw in his face, he has problems. And I said, look, uh, I, I do this, I do meditation, etc. And uh, if you're interested in talking about other issues than just our friendship, um, I'm, I'm here to help you. 
uh, or we ca I didn't say help you because it would have been uh, too much, you know, this difference. But I said, we can, we can always share. We always did. I, I, I wanted to continue this expanded, you know, definition of friends. And uh, he said, you know, he, he said, I'm okay, but, you know, I, I, I was fighting with a lot of things. I have, I have some demons, he, he tells me. And I was fighting. I became Catholic. I went to AA. I went to do this, went to do that. And I said, okay, but you still haven't gotten down to business here. It, it was all external. I said, he said, well, I'm not so sure I want to. I'm, I'm okay. I'm, I'm teaching. I have a wife. I have a boy. It's okay. But it wasn't okay. We talked one more time over the phone, and one more time we met. And I, I realized he will keep, he's so charismatic, he keeps 70, 80% of talking time, giving you not more than 20, 25%, and you still love him. And I said, he, he was great. He opened his mouth, and it's just, it was just like listening to heaven's knowledge. He was so smart. And uh, that was a little more than a year ago. He never called me back. And then, then I get the notice of the, of the funeral. Can you imagine? So if I didn't follow that voice inside, that kind of blip, that I should seek him out, I should connect to him, then I would feel guilty. And this way I just feel sad. I feel that some bondage was broken and this lifetime it will never come back. But I, I did what I had to. I did my part. And it was up to him to do his part. Maybe next lifetime.